Good morning, and once again, welcome. This lesson is being recorded for Sunday, November the 12th, 2023. This is the lesson that will be presented when we assemble together at uh, 10.50 a.m. Uh, and as is always the case, if you are in the area here in Bellflower, California, we want to invite you to come and be with us as we gather together each week to worship God at the Rose Avenue Church of Christ. We, we have our Bible study at 9.45. We have a morning worship at 10.50. Uh, another worship service at 6 o'clock in the evening and a, and a Bible study on Wednesday night at 7.30. And you're welcome at any and every one of those times that we gather together to worship God. As I've already said, this is the lesson that will be presented when we assemble uh, in the morning on this Sunday. But let's go ahead and uh, share the Word of God uh, with you. This is a continuation of our theme that we've been dealing with both last year and this year, drawing closer to God. And in this section of our study, we've been dealing with some challenges associated with our faith. Those challenges uh, that we've talked about thus far as we've talked about worldliness, and then we've devoted uh, uh, two or three lessons to materialism. Today, I want to talk about busyness in our lives and our concern with our overcrowded schedules. It is no secret that we are living in times where it is very, very easy to become um, overcommitted. And, and you know, it's interesting if you study the history of the development of technology in our nation, you'll know that it was not too many years ago, not too many decades ago, where we did not have nearly the conveniences that we have now. And you would think with more conveniences, that that would free up more time to, to do things that uh, are more productive and so on, and you can build things that you ought to be doing into your schedule. Yet it just seems that with the more conveniences we have, the less time that we have left over at the end of the day. And of course, the reason for that is we have made our lives more crowded. And rather than simplifying our lives, we have made our lives more complicated. And what we've done is we see a little bit of space here and um, a little bit of space of time. And, and, and rather than taking that time to decompress a little bit, or uh, we just add something else to it. We add some, something else to do or we add somewhere else that we want to go. And as a result of that, our lives become more and more crowded rather than less and less crowded. Now, there's a lot of problems that are associated with busyness. Um, and in this lesson, I want to talk about some of those things. You know, our work schedules, uh, uh, oftentimes they impact our personal study and, and, and time that we would spend in prayer with God, something that's actually crucial if we are to draw closer to God. Uh, school, social activities, sometimes they stand in the way of attending uh, gathering together with the saints as we are commanded to do within scriptures. Recreation sometimes chokes out the time that we would spend visiting the sick and discouraged of our number. Home projects, taking care of the house and, 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 and all the things that we have that, that we need to manage, um, it hinders our time that we spend trying to reach others. Sometimes uh, our friends take priority over our brethren when it comes to what we want to do and with who we want to do those things. So we need to be concerned about every one of these things because busyness has gotten in the way of many in their quest to draw closer to God. So with that in mind, let's look at some things in Scripture that deal with the idea of busy lives and, and how that is a challenge to our faith. And I, and I want to actually just notice a couple of things. Number one, I want to talk about the dangers that are associated with our busy lives. Then I, and uh, tied into that, we want to talk about some passages of Scripture, some principles that have addressed that. And then I want to uh, deal with uh, some suggestions to help us address busyness in our lives and things to think about so that our busyness will not draw us away from God. So let's go ahead and get started with this. And the first thing that I want to deal with, is, as I've noted, is some of the dangers 
that are associated with busyness. And probably one of the first dangers that we would give consideration to is the fact that God is often put on the back burner. In, uh, in other words, something else takes priority. A at this moment, there's something else that I need to do. A and and God gets put on the back burner so that I can do this. And, and God never gets moved forward, or rarely does he get moved forward. And we need to be concerned about that. You know, over in Luke chapter 9, and in verse number 57 here, we have an occasion where Jesus is... is um, is going along the road and he sees and somebody says to him I'll follow you wherever you go and Jesus basically points out well the life's not going to be easy I don't have anywhere to to lay my head but then he says to another one follow me and he says oh, I will uh, but let me first go bury my father uh, he goes on down a little bit further you know Lord I'll follow you but let me go say goodbye to my family so people kept putting things in the way and Jesus would answer those arguments and give warnings how those stand in your way of making God the priority that he ought to be. To, to be. And many people will put God on the back burner. And associated with that is oftentimes what God ends up getting is the leftovers. In other words, after we've managed everything else in our life, you know, if I have a little bit of time left, I'll give it to God. You know, as an example, you know, when it comes to assembling, there are those who they will assemble as long as there's not something else going on. You know, maybe I need to go to church. I've got a little bit of time. I want to go worship God. You know, over in the book of Malachi, the final book of the Old Testament, the corruptions of Israel that were creeping back in are being described. Now, they're not in idolatry anymore. But they're in a condition that in some ways is more deplorable. In, in verse 6 of Malachi chapter 1, we read there that a son honors his father, a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name? Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? Verse 7, you offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would, you accept, would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? So the point that is being made there is you're insulting me because what you're giving me is the leftovers. And you're giving me that which you can't use for something else. And, and it's interesting how he challenges them. You know, if you think that's acceptable, go give that to the king. You know, when you're giving the king a gift. Give him your, uh, give him your, 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 your broken things. You know, give him your animals that are worthless and see how he responds to you, how impressed he is with you. So we need to ask this question, you know, is, is God really first in my life? Or am I giving him leftovers? And oftentimes, oftentimes when our lives get so crowded and so busy, God gets what is left over. And that's a challenge. Another concern that we might think about along this line is we can easily become distracted. And I'm reminded of the example in Luke chapter 10, verses 41 and 42. And this is where Mary is visiting in the home of, uh, or Jesus is visiting in the home of Mary and Martha. And you, and you may remember the account there where, where uh, Martha is busy showing hospitality to Jesus. And I want you to understand, there's nothing wrong with that. As a matter, I'm, I'll even go as far as to say that was a good thing. It's a good thing from the standpoint of, uh, you know, Jesus had been invited into their home. And so she's preparing to be hospitable. She's honoring the Lord with her hospita uh, hospitality and so on. But Mary, rather than helping Martha, is just sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to the teaching of Jesus. And of course, Martha becomes upset, and Martha actually asks Jesus to uh, really to, to rebuke Mary because she wasn't helping. Tell Mary to help me. And the way Jesus responds is, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. 
Some versions actually use the word distracted there. You're distracted by many things. And he goes on, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. You're distracted, Martha. Uh, there's things more important than, than that the table be perfectly set. And those types of things. And that's the point that Jesus is making. And that describes many people in life. How many of us find ourselves more in the camp of Martha than we do in Mary? What describes the way that our life is going more? That's something we need to think about. You know, in life, there's consequences when you fail to show up. You know, uh, you fail to show up to work. There's going to be consequences. You fail to show up to school. There's going to be consequences. And there's many things in life like that. You know, you, you fail to show up for a court appearance. There's going to be a consequences associated with that. But, you know, when it comes to the spiritual things, oftentimes... In this life, there are going to be consequences, but oftentimes those are delayed. In other words, you don't, you don't see an immediate reaction because you haven't done this particular thing. And I think that sometimes gets in the way. And I think sometimes that's why people, uh, you know, they put God on the back burner. And they say, oh, you know, it's okay if I miss this time, you know, because I'm there the other times. And they put God on the back burner for whatever the activity is that you're engaged in there. And I'm going to tell you right now, oftentimes that leads to, to drifting. Remember how in Hebrews, thir or Hebrews chapter 2, and in verse 1, the Hebrew writer there warns, Therefore we must give the earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away. And of course, understand that when we talk about drifting, the idea is you're not speeding away from something, but you're just slowly and maybe even not even aware that you're drifting further away from God rather than drawing closer to God. Busyness can distract us. It can distract us from the things that are most important. Another danger that is often associated with busyness is it can actually rob us of the joy that God wants us to have. You know, in Philippians chapter 4, and in verse 4, Paul there said, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. We need to have joy in our lives. But I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes when we get busy and, we, and our lives are just so compacted with things to do, it can lead to stress. And, and anxiety that is, that is tied to the idea of stress. It can lead to the idea of we, we, just, we just have a life that is just full of pressure, and, and that pressure is what's causing the stress in, our, stress in our lives. It can lead to being impatient because, you know, you've just finished something and you need to get to the next thing. And so uh, there's a problem there, and you're impatient because of that person in front of you that's driving too slow and standing in your way of getting to where uh, you need to be. It can lead to irritability in your life, or you might want to use the word grumpiness or something like that. Uh, uh, sometimes we get so busy that it affects, it affects our disposition. It affects our attitude in dealing with others at time. When we, uh, uh, we fail to pause and contemplate and appreciate what God has done for us. Proverbs 12, 25, New King James says, Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. A good, man, a good word makes it glad. Maybe it's a good word you're telling yourself. But anxiety, anxiety it just causes troubles in our lives. And, and so busyness, it can rob us of the joy that we ought to have as Christians. And another danger we ought to give consideration to is, is that it can actually hinder our effectiveness spiritually. It can keep us from growing spiritually the way that we ought to. We're, we're too busy to do the things that are necessary 
for us to grow spiritually, for us to draw closer to God. You know, I need to ask myself, you know, when, when I study God's Word, I, I know there's many things that I'm told there that God expects me to be doing to build myself up and to grow, and things to help others in their growth and so on. I, and, you know, I need to wonder, am I actually fulfilling my responsibilities uh, the way that I ought to spiritually? You know, uh, sometimes we get so busy like I said, our, our spiritual growth is put on the back burner. You know, I, I know I know I need to be here, and I know I need to do this for for somebody, one of my brethren, but I'm just too busy right now. I'll do it later. I know I need to be reading through the Bible, but I just don't have time right now. I'll get to it a little later, and those types of things. Am I really doing my best for God? Am I really doing my best for my Lord? You know, and here's an interesting thing about this. If I'm so busy, how do I respond when the unexpected happens? You know, something, something, something pops up that's not in my plans, and it throws my plan completely out of control. How do I respond in those situations? That's things that we need to think about when it comes to our, uh, our overcommitted lifestyles. And the bottom line is, busyness is often a sign of worldliness that we have talked about. Is our busyness showing that we prefer the world over God? Is our busyness showing that we prefer the world over God in a given area or at a given time? Those are all things that we need to give consideration to. So think about that when we talk about the dangers of busyness. And I hope you can see in that how busyness is a challenge as we strive to draw closer to God. Now, what, what about the Bible and busyness? Well, you know, we've already, we've already mentioned several verses in here. We've talked about the excuses that people make. Uh, we've talked about Mary and Martha. Uh, we've talked about... Uh, how we are to be rejoicing the way that we ought to, and we've dealt with various other, uh, various other verses of Scripture. But there's two or three other principles that we could mention associated with the idea of busyness. In Ephesians chapter five, verses fifteen and sixteen, Paul there says, "See that you walk circumspectly." Um, um, let me read it again. Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse number 16, he makes the point there. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. And Colossians 4, 5 talks about redeeming the time as well. And of course, the point of both those texts is I need to walk wisely where this uh, world is concerned. And I need to be careful about how I use my time. My time needs to be properly managed. That's what's associated with the idea of redeeming the time. Realize that when time is spent, you're not going to get it back. So that's, that's a, a, a principle in scripture that we need to think about when we look at our busy lives. Another one that I think about is Matthew 5 and verse 8, where Jesus in giving what we call the Beatitudes said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I mean, think about what are we talking about in, in this entire theme, drawing closer to God. What can we do to help us see God? Well, we need purity of heart. Well, you know, when you think about what purity is, purity means that something is unpolluted, which means you have not added to it that which poisons or damages the heart, but it is also undiluted. It is not watered down. If something is watered down, it's not pure. We need pure hearts that are unpolluted and undiluted. Busyness dilutes our faithfulness sometimes, our, our spiritual condition. And it might even be polluting our spiritual condition because of the things that we are replacing what we ought to be doing for God with. 
And then, of course, there's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and in verse number 11. And Paul will revisit this at least to a degree in uh, 2 Thessalonians where he says, You aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and work with your own hands as we commanded you. Lead a quiet life. Don't be so overwhelmed with your life that you're stressed out all the time. I think in that expression, you lead a quiet life. You make your life simple. Rather than making it more complicated, make it simpler. And you might add contentment to that uh, associated with those things. So those are some principles in the Bible that that we would give consideration to when we think about the idea of what the Bible says about busyness. Now, for the remainder of my time in this lesson, I want to say, okay, well, busyness is a danger. What can I do about it? Let's discuss some principles and, and some things that we can do to help us deal with the concept of busyness. And, of course, the first thing that I want to observe, and you'll note in many of these things I've talked about, uh, you know, I've talked about materialism, and I've emphasized, you know, money's not wrong. Having possessions is not wrong within itself. It's, it's about how you manage what you have, your attitude toward those things. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, when it comes to the idea of busyness, we need to understand that being busy is not wrong. As a matter of fact, I will even go as far as to say that you ought to be busy. You know, Jesus over in John chapter 9 and uh, verse number 4, he there made the point, I must work the works of God while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. He's making the point there that I need to be busy. There's things that need to be done, and I need to be doing these things. And I'm going to be doing these things. So understand, Jesus, when you study his life, you'll see that his life is a life of, uh, of busyness. That's actually one of the hallmarks of the Gospel of Mark in describing how Jesus was constantly on the move doing this and that. Let me tell you right now, Mark points some other things out also. We'll see that. Yeah, understand that the Bible tells us that sloth, which is laziness, is actually condemned in Scripture. You know, over in the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 9, you read there, He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Or in Proverbs 21 and verse 25, the desire of the lazy man kills him for his hands refuse to labor. And Solomon's not speaking uh, complimentary of that. You know, when somebody says, oh, I'm just kind of taking it easy and, uh, and you know, uh, I'm just trying to get in touch with myself, not doing anything. The Bible calls that laziness. And it's condemned. Over in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse, Paul, and verse 10, Paul there says, We commanded you that if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. That's a condemnation of somebody who needs to be out there providing for himself and possibly his family. And he's not doing it. You know, over there in 2 Timothy, you know, um, um, or, uh, or 1 Timothy, Paul there makes the point that uh, he who does not provide for his own house has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We need to provide for our families. You need to get out there and work. You need to be busy. And so you find laziness. It's often, it's often tied to refusing to be busy in work. You know, I think of the parable of the um, the parable of the talents in, in Matthew chapter 25. Remember, you know, a master is going on his journey and he calls together three of his servants and according to their ability, he gives them talents to manage while he is away. And a talent was a large sum of money. One he gave five, another two, and then of course you got the one talent servant. And of course you know the way it goes that when he returns, 
both the five and the two talent servant had doubled that which they had been given to manage. And they were told, well done, good and faithful servant. You know what? It can be implied that while their master was gone, they were busy. They were industrious. They were doing what needed to be done, and they were productive as a result of that. Now, the one talent servant, you know, he comes and, and he tells his master, you know what, I buried it in the ground. I was afraid that I would fail, and, and, and you'd be upset if, if, if I lost all of this. So I did nothing. And the master called him a wicked and lazy servant. And he was punished as a result of his laziness and his wickedness. He did nothing. And that was, and, and the point is, is that was wrong. We are going to be held accountable for whether or not we're willing to do what we're supposed to do. So understand, when we deal with the idea of busyness, I am not saying that you should not do anything and that you should not have a life that is busy. But there is something you need to consider. That is the fact that laziness is not always the opposite of busyness. Laziness can be the antithesis of being busy, but that's not always the case. You know, there are some out there who they think that if they are not busy all the time, that they will be perceived as lazy, or they will think to themselves, oh, if I'm not busy, I must be a lazy person, so I need to be doing more, and they pile more onto their activities. And I'm going to tell you right now, there are some who they guilt other people with that. You know, if you are not busy, they guilt you into thinking that you are lazy, or they imply that you are lazy. There's a problem with that. But I want you to understand, if somebody chooses to not do something or to overbook their lives, oftentimes they're doing that because it shows wisdom and it shows priority and, and balance where their life is concerned. And we're going to touch on those here in just a minute as we deal with how you deal with busyness. You know, so I, I want you to understand that, uh, you know, somebody that chooses to not overbook. It's not that they're lazy. It's that they're balanced in their life. And they're, they're showing wisdom as they put their calendar of what to do together. So keep that in mind when we talk about the subject of busyness. But there's some other things that we need to give consideration to. The first thing when it comes to dealing with busyness in your life is you need to examine yourself. And we frequently point this out because this is, this is where we begin. It's, it's where you always begin when you're dealing with a situation in your life. You need to see where am I in relation to where I need to be. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5 tells you, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself or prove yourself. Do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? We, we need to examine ourselves, and, and, and that's where it starts. You know, over in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 31, Paul there said, um, you know, whatever you do, 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 do all to the glory of God. You know, when I look at my life and I look at why I'm doing everything that I'm doing, I need to be asking, is what I am doing to the glory of God in one way or another? And, and, and uh, there's a lot to unpack in that particular statement there. I mean, if you're, if you're exercising, there's a sense in which you can be doing it to the glory of God because you're taking care of yourself so you'll be more healthy to be able to do what you need to do for him. But I also need to ask myself, you know, all these things I'm doing, is what I'm doing necessary or is it a choice that I have made? And what are the consequences of that choice? In what I am doing, am I robbing God? You know, you go back to Malachi that we read a little earlier. In Malachi 3 and verse 
8, the question is asked, will a man rob God? And that's a very powerful question to give consideration to. And, you know, oftentimes, and what he was dealing with there is he, they were not giving God what they were supposed to give him. You know, they were giving him the leftovers. And, of course, the Jews, they had a responsibility to provide a tithe to God. They weren't doing all that. But I want you to think about this. Are we robbing God? And maybe it's not with our money. You know, maybe we're uh, providing the contribution as faithfully as we ought to, or maybe we're giving a little bit extra. Great. But what about my time? Am I robbing God when it comes to my time? How much am I giving him? Is my spirituality suffering because of the busyness in my life? So you can see, I, I need to take a step back and stop for a moment and actually examine my life, where I'm at, and where I need to be. And when I've done that, I also need to learn the importance of prioritizing things in my life. And this is crucial to dealing with the idea of busyness. As I establish my schedule, and as I look at uh, what I ought to be doing, I need to always keep in mind Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Isn't that what the entire New Testament is really emphasizing? God needs to be first in my life. I go back to that Ephesians 5 where he talks about redeeming the time, but he says there, see that you walk circumspectly, as the New King James says. Other versions emphasize, see that you walk mindfully. In other words, you know, you're thinking as you are making your decision. And when it comes to your time, uh, you know what is most important. You know, in Romans chapter 12 and in verse number 2, Paul there makes the point, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need to realize that when it comes to serving God, that it starts with our mind. It starts with the mindset, because the mindset is going to govern everything else. And that mindset is going to help me determine what's most important. And something we need to think about when we talk about what's most important is we, we need to consider that we're not necessarily talking about what good versus bad. You know, if, if something is sinful, obviously it's the thing you ought not to be doing. But what about if the choice you're making is between some two things that are good? And then you have to make a judgment about... Which of those two things is better? And, you know, maybe you have a list of three or four things, and you say, you know what, I've got four things here, or, and uh, three of them are better than the other one. Okay, so that answers the one. But what about, I'm still over overcommitted. Well, then between the two better things, which of those is the best of the things that I need to do? You know, th that actually goes back to, to Mary, where, where Jesus, you know, lovingly, I, I believe he's rebuking Martha lovingly. You're distracted over all these things. But Mary has chosen the good part. Mary has chosen what is better. Mary has chosen what is best. And that's not going to be taken away from her. So that's the emphasis of what we're talking about. You know, I need to learn the importance of prioritizing when I look at what all is going on in my life. And of course, as I'm establishing my priorities, I need to be seeking first the kingdom of God, which means in my schedule, I have to make time for God talking about private time because I'm going to tell you right now that's where you are going to draw closer to God when it's just you and God in your private room in your closet or however you want to describe it that's where it's between you and God and there's no hiding who you are from God God knows 
everything. And as I've already pointed out, even in these studies here, in these busy times, we cannot afford to not think about God, to not give God some time, to not pause during the day to read some of his word, to not pause during the day to, uh, to pray to God, private prayers to God. And I'm not just talking about the, the 15 seconds that we take before a meal to say thank you. I'm talking about build some time into your schedule for God. You know, Jesus, I've already talked about how, you know, Jesus was busy. In, in Acts chapter 10 and in verse 38, as, Paul, as Peter is talking to Cornelius, as he introduces Jesus, it says there, he went about doing good. That's what defined Jesus. He did good for so many. But I want to tell you right now, he found time to pray. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, it says there in that text that he arose early in the morning before daylight and he went out to a deserted place and he prayed. Luke chapter 5 and verse 16 tells you that uh, he regularly prayed. And then there's Mark chapter 6. You know, uh, Mark chapter 6 records a time when he has sent out his disciples. This is more likely um, parallel to what you read in Matthew chapter 10 where he sends out his 12 apostles, you know, and he gives them instructions about uh, going to teach others and so on. But in Mark, just very briefly, and Mark is often brief, Mark in chapter 6 and in verse number 30, we read there where it says, the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And Jesus said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. Jesus said, stop. Take a moment. Rest a little bit. Friends, we need to make time for those things. And, and in our busy lives, we need to pause, and if God is our priority, and if we're striving to draw closer to God, we need to make time for God in our schedules. You know, when I think about Paul, you know, there's not a letter that Paul writes, I don't think, that where he doesn't sometime talk about who he's praying for and praying for somebody. We know Paul was busy. He was very busy. But he found time to pray. He found time to do what needed to be done. So I'm going to tell you right now, you need to schedule personal time with God in your life. Well, somebody might say, but, but I'm just so busy right now. Well, you may need to clean house. And what I mean by that is expression, you know, we sometimes use this word, we sometimes use the word cluttered. You know, and you think about you think about a place that is cluttered. That means you know you go into a room and you just see so much stuff everywhere, and it's just an it's just an absolute distraction. You know, I I uh, I, I like to to take foot uh, to pictures. Uh, I I kind of like to think of myself as a photographer, and I'm trying to learn from other photographers how to take a good picture. And one of the things that virtually every instructor will tell you is avoid cluttered pictures. And what they what they mean by that is, in a picture, if you want a picture to be effective, there needs to be one thing that is featured in the picture. But if you just take a picture of, of the overall setting, and yes, it's beautiful, and when you're looking at it, you know, you're on your vacation and you see this beautiful place, and you just take a picture and there's there's mountains and there's water and there's trees and there's everything else, there's sky and all those things. And and you ask the question, what's the what's the subject of this picture? It's cluttered. And therefore it's not a good picture. Well, that's what happens in our lives. Sometimes our lives get so full. And so cluttered that nothing is what it ought to be. If our plate is too full, something has to give. You know, actually, as I was preparing this lesson, I was 
Uh, I came across the illustration of a buffet. You know, you know, talking about somebody with their plate being too full. You know, you go to the buffet and, you know, you pile that plate up so high that it can't hold anything else. And then you see something else that you want. And when you put that on the plate, something falls off the plate. So you can't do it all. That's the point to give consideration to that. You know, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul there says, I plead with you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. How often do we remind ourselves in drawing closer to God that we need to be willing to sacrifice for Him? I'm going to tell you right now, when it comes to our busyness, we need to think about being living sacrifices for Him. Remember how the apostles, you know, uh, Jesus in Mark 10, verse 28, they, they said to him, we've left all to follow you. And, you know, you think about the apostles and what they gave up. You know, when, when Jesus initially called the apostles, you, you read about Peter, Andrew, James, and John, uh, uh, the fishermen. He says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They leave their boats. They walked away from their job to follow Jesus. And I'm not telling you to walk away from your job. But that's the point. Uh, 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 Matthew, a tax collector, he walked away from his tax collecting to follow the Lord. You know what? If your plate is full, if it's too full, something has to give. And, and, if, and if I'm so busy that I don't have time to read the Bible and to, to pray and to, to be with my brethren, something has to give. And the question is, what am I willing to give up? Am I going to give up my study and my prayer? Or am I going to or give up something else so that I can study and pray more? That's something I need to think about when it comes to this subject. And, of course, then there's the idea of I need to budget my time where these things are concerned. You know, what exactly is a budget? In broad terms, you know, and I'm, so you know it's often applied to money. And, uh, but, but in broad terms, a, a budget is a plan to make sure that you're not using more than you have. In other words, you start off, okay, this is, this is what I have at my disposal. And... I have to make sure that I don't use all this up. So I have to budget. I, I have to, and there's things that I have to do, and I need to add those in my budget first, and then I see what's left over, and I can decide what I can do with what's, with what's left over. And, you know, we think about that with money, but doesn't that apply to time? I need to budget my time. Again, redeem the time. I need to budget my time. And make sure that what is most important is built into that schedule. As a matter of fact, it needs to be at the top of the schedule. Okay, I've, I've got to budget this much time for prayer and study as an illustration of that. I need to budget in my week those times when we assemble together with the saints. It needs to be inflexible or re reasonably inflexible as I think about those things. It's just, it's, it's, you know, I'm not going to let anything deliberately get in the way of those things. They're budgeted and they are a part of the priority. So I need to budget my time. Another thing I need to consider when it comes to busyness is I need to realize the importance of balance. We need to be busy, but not too busy. You know, uh, there's, there are many commitments we have in life that have to become a part of our balance. It would be nice to spend all day every day, you know, reading your Bible and praying and all those things. But there's other things that have to be done. You know, you have a job and you have to provide for your family. You have to take care of yourself. You have to sleep. You have to feed yourself. Uh, uh, there are things you need to do for others. There are commitments that you have that are associated with your life, and they need to be factored in to your schedule. But the point is, is there's got to be some balance there. 
Yes, I got to do all these things. But most of us, honestly, all of us, when you get beyond those things that you have to do just to live, you know, to, to maintain your house and, and to ensure that you have a house, which is why you work and all those kind of things, we have some time left over. That's what we're dealing with. Do not neglect the things that need to be done in your life, including uh, enough time to rest the way that you ought to so that you can be healthy. Uh, working for others. We need balance in our lives. It's just as, as you begin to balance things, God needs to be a part of the balance. As a matter of fact, as we pointed out, he needs to be the priority as we balance our lives. And that brings us just to two more points and then, and then we'll be done with the lesson. One of them is um, I need to build in extra time in my life. You know, the bottom line is, is as we're going through life, you know, the expression is life happens. And you know what that means, right? You know, the point that life happens means that you have the best of plans. And as you're moving along with your plans, something is going to get in the way. Something's going to break or something's going to break down or an unforeseen uh, circumstance is going to come up. And it is something where you're going to have to stop what you're doing and deal with that because it becomes an immediate concern. Well, the question is, as I'm budgeting my life and as I'm building in the time and so on, do I have a margin in place? You know, uh, when you think about a margin, that is a space, uh, one person just defined it as a space between our load and our limit. And the point is, is the load that you have given yourself does not need to push up to the edge of the limit. There needs to be a margin. There needs to be a little space between those to offset the unexpected, to give you enough time to be not stressed as you're moving from one thing to the next. Friends, when are not rushed. We're less stressed and, and we're better prepared to address those curveballs when they come their way because we built in those little margins between the things that we know we need to be doing. And friends, you need to include rest and, and time to uh, relax a little bit in your life. Those are absolutely crucial. You know, I'm reminded of Mark chapter 2 and verse 27 where, you know, Jesus there being criticized for healing on the Sabbath and other things. And he makes the point there that man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. Now, I'm not going to discuss the Sabbath itself from a theological standpoint or even the theology of the context where Jesus is saying that. But it is worthy to think about this. What was the purpose of the Sabbath? God commanded that the Israelites take a day and just rest. You now you're going to worship God on that day. You're going to think about God on that day. And you're going to serve him on that day. But stop. Stop working. I command you to stop working, the Lord would say. And rest. Let your body recover. You know, just think about it from that standpoint. The Sabbath was made for man. God intended for us to take some time to decompress. So in dealing with busyness, we need to build a little bit of extra time in to our lives. And I'm going to tell you right now, when margins are in place, we won't stress as much over the little things. Because as that uh, distraction comes along, or you know, as that unexpected thing comes along, I have a little bit of margin where I can stop and deal with it. You know, if margins are in place, I'm not going to habitually be late. Whether you're dealing with services or whether you're dealing 
with somebody else because I built in a margin. And, and so I, I know here I, I need to leave a little earlier. But, and I built that in in my schedule. So that's what we need to do. And then finally, we need to learn to say no. You know, do you ever find that your heart says no when somebody is asked, but your mouth says yes? That becomes a problem. We need to realize that we cannot do everything for everyone. And furthermore, God, God doesn't expect us to do that. And that can be emphasized in a number of different ways. I'm going to tell you right now, it's not healthy. If every time somebody asks you to do something, you always say, yes, it's not healthy, it's going to impact you spiritually, it's going to rob you of the time that you would spend thinking about his word, studying, praying, it's going to affect you mentally, and in time, it's going to affect you spirit physically. Oftentimes, oftentimes when we can't say no, it leads to bitterness as we're doing whatever we're doing, maybe even toward the one that we're doing it. It leads to the stress in our lives. It leads to exhaustion. And it may even lead to the idea of being exploited. And what I mean by being exploited is somebody guilts you into, you know, if you don't do this for me, uh, you know, uh, you're not being who you ought to be. You're not being the Christian you ought to be. Don't let that, don't let others villainize you when you're doing the best you can. And don't villainize yourself because you say no every once in a while. And we need to say a lot of no's sometimes. Now, understand, I'm not saying here that we always say no. That's a clear point to understand. If you're always saying no, that says something about who you are and your character. It says that you're thinking about yourself and not about others. So I'm not saying that, but you can't do everything for everybody. And it's not wrong to say no. Sometimes you have to. You know, is your priorities going to suffer? If you don't say no, <laughs> you know, Jesus said no over in Mark chapter one and in verse 38, you know, here, uh, here we have an occasion where, um, you know, and this is the passage we read a few moments ago in verse 35, you know, Jesus before morning, he went to pray and then, and then the disciples come to him and they, and they find him and they say, everybody's looking for you. And in verse 38, Jesus said, let us go into the next town that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come. You know, Jesus says, I need to go somewhere else. I can't stay here. He said no to those who were looking for him there, and he went to the next place. You know, it's interesting. Jesus even appointed 12 men to help him spread the gospel, to spread the message. And that was just to get started with it. They were going to employ others to help them as well. Jesus didn't do it all by himself. You know, sometimes when somebody's asking for something, we need to say no and let somebody else help them. Or maybe they need to help themselves in some circumstances. Moses was getting exhausted when Jethro, his father-in-law, in Exodus 18, says, you can't, this isn't good for you. You need some help. Get others to help you do this. You need to learn to say no. When we're dealing with busyness, that's what we need to be concerned about. So there you have some principles that can help us as we deal with our busy lives. Remember, in all of this, we are striving to draw closer to God. And in order to do that, we need to give him the time in our week that he deserves. And I hope that you have seen in this lesson the significance of that. So with that, I, I commend this lesson to you, and I hope you find some benefit in the things that I have said there. How are you managing your time as it relates to God and your own life? So think about that. And the lesson's yours. And if you would, please uh, bow with me at this time. Dear God and our Heavenly Father, we always come to you and, and we're so thankful for all that you have blessed us with. And we are thankful for the 
opportunities that we have and where we live, and, and we thank you for our jobs, and we thank you for um, um, the resources that we have at our disposal. We, we thank you that we have the ability to be productive in our lives, and we pray that you will help us to do that. But help us to be wise managers of our time and to ensure that we do not leave you and your ways out of our time. In fact, help us to, help us to appreciate how you ought to be the priority of our lives as we manage what we are doing, where we are going, and everything else in our lives. So help us, dear God, to put you first as we strive to draw closer to you. We pray this in your son's name, and amen. And as always, thank you for listening to this lesson. I hope that you find some benefit in the thing that is being emphasized here. God needs to be first in your life, and, and, and that includes your schedule. So think about that as you go through this day and as you go through the rest of this week and as you make uh, plans for your future. You know, we're, we're in the middle of November. We're only a month and a half away from 2024. If you make resolutions, why not start thinking about that now and get things in, in place so that you're ready to do that? So think about that, and thank you for listening to this lesson. So until next time, have a, have a good day and have a good week.